Meditations with Ryan Slomack. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 7 of Meditations. On today's show, we have Kelly Tompkins. Kelly is the owner of the Blue Moon Apothecary in Liverpool, New York, and This is not completely a conversation about what apothecaries are, though we do touch on it. It's a conversation about the importance of sort of checking in with yourself and figuring out what you need to thrive. Kelly had a very robust career working in IT and then had some some signs that sort of told her that maybe she should move on and make her five-year plan a two-year plan. And... I really learned a lot in this conversation. It was a great chance to think about modern medicine versus holistic medicine, the importance of tuning into ourselves to figure out the root cause of the symptoms we're experiencing, and also just sort of think about our place in the world and the way in which there may be a manner for us to take a step back, evaluate what's going on, and then offer something to our community just as Kelly has with the Blue Moon Apothecary. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Great. So Kelly, thanks so much for joining me on the show. One of the things that I like about your shop a lot is that it's so tea centric. So I figured we start at the current and then go back to the past. Uh, and I'm sitting here drinking some, uh, what is it, warm crimson berry tea. I was curious what your tea of the day was. I have actually had two different tea blends today. I started with Snipple No More because fall is approaching and it's allergy season again. And then a cup of elderberry tea to boost your immune system. I love it. Have you always been a tea person? I grew up drinking tea because I was the sickly child. So tea with honey, lemon, whiskey, um, <laughs> all those wonderful old wives tales and remedies. That is what I drink very frequently. Interesting. So when you were when you were growing up was like, I, I guess, was this sort of focus on holistic medicine, something that you were aware of in your household? It was a 50-50 split. So if grandma was around, which she was my whole entire life, but I did move from Florida to New York. So then grandma wasn't there as often as she was before. But she was the, if you have an ear infection, this is what you do. If you were sick, this is what you do. Mom followed recommendations from grandma on how to, you know, take care of it at home because growing up, we did not have health insurance. We, my dad was self-employed in Florida as a contractor, but then when we moved to New York, his goal was to be a dairy farmer. Therefore, there's no health insurance. And about four decades ago, (laughs) we'll give it about four decades ago, we didn't have health insurance. It wasn't a thing, but we were also one parent income back then. So we butchered our own animals. We grew our own vegetables. We did our own berry picking. We were the kids featured in a book in the Catskills of Old School Remedies, picking dandelions. So it's always been around, but it wasn't a primary focus, I guess, is the best way to put it. That's interesting. Like that, just that idea that, um, I don't know. It's 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 in the ether, and it's something that maybe you don't necessarily pay attention to because it's just the way things were. Exactly. So it was there, and you know, you didn't think twice about it. I still treat my children the same way. You know, if their ear is bothering them, they get oil. You know, if they're starting to get stuffy, they're having tea with honey. Well, raw local honey is amazing for helping to build up intolerances possibly to anything that's in the environment in the spring or in the fall. But it's it's crazy what you, you know, apple a day keeps the doctor away. If you're sick, you need chicken soup. Oh, I make chicken soup faithfully, but I also make it from bone broth. I boil those bones for two days. I love it. So it's interesting that your uh your dad had a pretty significant career change going from being a contractor to being a dairy farmer. Uh, and that apparently was something that made its way into you. You worked for quite a long time in the uh, in IT, specifically with different financial institutions. When you were when you were younger, what sort of brought you into that IT space? I actually took courses through high school for IT, so I ended up with a two year certificate by the time I graduated school. 
and I opted not to go into college afterwards. My goal was not to work in the corporate world, I guess is the best thing to say. I wanted to be be a mother. I wanted five children. I wanted a ranch. I had all of these aspirations that were not the same as people I went to high school with, I suppose. So I was a little bit backwards. I didn't go to college the first time until I was 24. And then I went a second time in my early 30s. And then I went a fourth time in my 40s. So I just kept continuing. But I ended up with a career when I was around 28, 30 years old, which led me into IT. I was the backup IT person for other companies, small mom and pop shops. But with IT, I was never busy. I'm not not busy. I was never bored and you were always busy. So everything changed. You had to be sharp. You, your mind was occupied all the time. And I was always trying to problem solve. And that's what it was for me. You always are trying to find that puzzle piece that fits just right and fix whatever is ailing somebody. So I no longer do it in a corporate setting. I now do it with making organic teas and body care products and seeing what the root cause is that's ailing somebody now rather than a device. Yeah. What? Uh, so you were in, you know, you worked for, uh, you worked for some banks and like you, as you mentioned, some mom pop shops kind of doing IT stuff. Um, you know, like enjoying that fast paced environment, enjoying that inherent problem solving. What made you decide that it was time for a career change? Because going from uh, you know, different institutions where you've got these these inherent systems that help back you up uh, to all of a sudden kind of being on your own. What what made you decide to make that shift? I think the biggest factor was people. Um, I have a phrase, mean people suck. They just do. Nobody likes mean people. But sometimes you have to figure out what makes people tick. And a lot of times they may be unhappy or unhealthy and you just want to help them find their path. And it's generally a healing path. So whether the chronic ulcers or everybody uses the term IBS or you have migraines or whatever is going on in your world, or if you're suffering from a significant loss of a family member for years. I I suppose I'm in the position now where I can build a safe space for people to come in regardless of what brought them into the store, whether they need a place that's quiet and they can meditate and read a book, or if it's a place where they can chat with friends or find something new from a local artist or do a meditation class or get a massage. But when you're in the corporate environment and the type of corporate environments I was in, I learned a lot. I grew a lot. I was good at what I did. But there were things that I saw that I couldn't address in the position I was in. And I'd rather help a person on their journey than upgrade somebody's software. I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting being within those systems and just like inherently feeling helpless, you know, like knowing that this system is working for 75% or 50% of the people. And then you've got this whole drop off where, well, that's just the way it is. And like, at some point, I think that starts to wear on you. It, it does. I mean, I was a very active person and I'm starting my journey to becoming another very active person. I ran marathons and I hiked all the time and I swam all the time and I was always in the woods whenever I could be. For a long time, I had a very good work life balance. When the pandemic arised, I was an essential employee. There were a few cutbacks, 
not as many as most companies. I did not lose my job, thankfully. But that's when I lost my work-life balance. So I would go out for a run, like, yes, all right, get up really early. I'm going to hit the roads. I'm going to do five, 10 miles, come back. Nobody will even know I was gone. I would get a mile down the road. And I was getting a phone call because I had a client that needed help. And the pattern just kept increasing and increasing. And I wasn't even able to leave my home office to go to the next room to have dinner with my family that I put in a crock pot for breakfast time at breakfast time for us to have dinner together that night. The kids sometimes would be in bed before I even fixed what the issue was for some clients. It's it's interesting in the sense that like uh I, I oftentimes working in education, think about skills that we don't necessarily teach or we don't know how to teach. Um, and everybody always goes for financial literacy. That's like the easy one. Like, oh, my high school math class didn't teach me how to balance my checkbook. Like, This is probably true. Um, but there's ways to learn that. Learning work-life balance is a totally different skill set. Um, and just like as I've been designing this education class this semester, like I specifically put that in. Like we have a work-life balance like unit. Um, because like at working in education, I want teachers who are going to be, you know, going into these positions to know what I didn't know, which is it's okay to sit there and say like, you know what, I'm not going to answer emails after five o'clock. I'm, you know, and, and I think that sort of inherent empowerment is something that's really hard to do in the pandemic threw a lot of people off. It did. It was difficult because there was a sort shortage of people that were still working and I supported frontline staff. So if I didn't, I don't know, get the computer up, a doctor couldn't write prescriptions for somebody they just saw in the office. So you want to make sure you're helping so that it doesn't bottleneck them any more than it already is. But at the same time, you're paying for it physically yourself. So. Yeah. And to our comment about systems before, we didn't have systems for these things, you know, like who knew yeah. that you were going to need these new shifts and a third shift online person who's going to be, you know, in ensuring that there's a support system for this other business. Um, it's hard to have that weight on your shoulders. What um, so you you opened the Blue Moon Apothecary uh, at the airing of this episode uh, one year and three days ago. Congratulations on your one year anniversary. Yeah. Um, what? You know, what were the sort of steps you took to 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 leave this, uh, you know, I guess, poor work life balance behind and, and find a new a new venture? So. I went on vacation last May with my family, the first vacation in years, the first real vacation in years. And we were in the Appalachian, which is roots to my mom's side of the family. And I sat on the deck one day, just looking off the mountain. And it was like, I don't want to do what I do anymore. I need to do something different. And mind you, I had been taking all of my courses online. I had a five-year plan in my head. But I was to the point where I was like, this needs to happen sooner than five years. Came home from vacation went out for a beautiful morning walk and saw a for rent sign. I called. I didn't tell anybody I was calling. Made the phone call. Went to look at the space. Went back a second time. Looked at it again and gave a deposit. And if I didn't have the support system I have in my life, I never would have done it. So I had my own little cheering squad at home and it's been a struggle. It's not rainbows and unicorns. We are now a one income family <laughs> with children. So that does, you know, shift how we do things now, but I would never change it for the world. That's awesome. There's just like the serendipity of that. It's just like when you're starting up, a business that's based on healing and the universe is literally giving you these signs, like within such a short time span, you, you kind of have to acknowledge them. It was seriously two weeks, two weeks after I got home from vacation. And I was just like, Oh, huh. 
do I call? Don't I call? Like, yeah, I call. And it just fell into place. So one of the things that, so this was, and just to clarify, this was May, 2022. That was May, 2022. All right. So one of the things that people don't tend to focus on when talking about new businesses is that weird, uh, I don't know, moment of like entrepreneurial purgatory, I guess is what I'd call it, which is that space between your opening date and getting everything ready. I think most people think that you, you know, like, oh, you rent the space and then you take about a month and then you've got a business and then you've got money coming in and then life is great and you uh, buy a yacht. And I don't, I personally as an entrepreneur have not had that experience. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious about like what, tell me about that, that time after that two week span where you've got, you know, you, you've got the space and you've got the mindset. And I, I love the fact that you were just mulling this over. Like this is part of the five-year plan, but eh, we're going to make it a two week plan instead of a five-year plan. Like what happened in those, you know, in those months between May and October to get everything open? So craziness, a lot of craziness. Um, I instantly, after I signed the lease agreement, my lease didn't start until July 15th. Okay. So I had, after I signed the lease agreement, about a six-week buffer so that I could formally give my notice at work and then, you know, pass any projects and any training or anything like that over to the next person. And I went thrifting. I went shopping. Um, I went treasure hunting. You cannot have an apothecary shop with some, some really cool old stuff. Like, you just can't. And not for nothing, I don't like to buy new. If something can have a second life, if I can repurpose something, I would rather bring it back and give it a new job for the rest of its existence. I went and I found furniture at barn sales, estate sales. I found old books that I fell in love with and I didn't think anybody else would appreciate. And I gave them a new home. So we do have books that you can just casually browse and read through. We have a need a book, take a book, have a book, leave a book shelf. I've restored different furnitures in different colors <laughs> throughout the shop just to kind of bring it all together with my crazy eclecticness. But that's what I started with. Plus, you know, making sure I had enough inventory to make the products that I was going to make. So it was designing the labels and the product descriptions and specking out the register system and the barcode printer that goes with the register and then equipment. I needed prep sinks. I needed coolers. I needed a bakery display. Like I needed all of this stuff because I wanted it to be perfect when it opened. It's still becoming perfect. It changes constantly. I have a new display that I bought over the weekend. So I'm rearranging and trying to find places for the product to go so they can pop when people walk in and be like, oh yeah, look over here. You know, there's a lot going on in the shop but it's evolving every day. I love it. In, in the in the spirit of preparation, one of the things I did want to ask you about, because uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer of it in whether you have a an organization or anything is developing a mission statement. Um, it doesn't, you know, I, I think sometimes we can get, we can get caught up in, in language and we can say, oh, it doesn't quite work. Da, 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 and then we lose the mission while we're talking about the mission statement. But I think yours is really interesting. It's a uh, spread kindness to all who enter the sanctuary of the Blue Moon Apothecary and Wellness Center. Help others find their way through non-evasive alternative healing methods. Inspire freedom from self-doubt and self-constraints. Focus on self-care by providing all organic personal care products. And lastly, take control of your future. How, how did that piece of the business come together? So the mission statement actually spells out an acronym. So I think little by little, each one of us should do our own little part to make a shift. It doesn't matter if it's a shift of mindset. It doesn't matter if it's a shift of what impact your footprint you leave on this world. But we all are responsible to make a shift. My shift is also to promote 
local artisans and people here in the United States. It's a little bit scary when you don't see anything that's made here in a store. All the things that are bad for children to wear and even adults, they're not manufactured here. My grandparents, my parents, my great grandparents, people knew how to do things for themselves. They could make their own tables. They could make their own chairs. They could build their own houses. We still build our own houses and all of that. But how many pairs of shoes do you own that are made here in the United States? Where do your t-shirts come from? It's honestly crazy that we're such a large company or country and we have all of these countries here, but so much is outsourced. I just think that we need to take pride in what we make and what we do. So I have shirts in the store and I spec them out with the vendor. They are made in the U.S. They are assembled in the U.S. They are printed in the U.S. And I just think it's wonderful that if we can all just start contributing to what we do here, we can flourish. Well, let's let's do this real quick. Let's uh, let's go into a moment of guided imagery, shall we? So sure. this uh, this show, uh, a lot of people from Central New York listen to, but I've got listeners in Denmark and Italy and Australia and uh, all over the place, which is really exciting. Um, at, tell us, just give us kind of an overview of what is the Blue Moon Apothecary and Wellness Center. Uh, yeah, just kind of kind of lead us through visioning this place. It's a little quirky. Um, it's a little eclectic. Not all the furniture matches because I do bring different pieces back to life. So they have another purpose again. So when you walk in, you'll see a blue wooden bench. So people could just sit there, have a cup of tea, read or wait for one of the appointments with one of the practitioners. I have a huge display of organic hand blended teas. Honestly, there's a lot on there. It holds over a hundred bags of tea. We have a chalkboard wall that I painted in the main retail shop area, which of course gives you the wireless password, but it also gives you a quote of the day, something to ponder and think about or have a discussion with somebody. Now we have a large table where you can come and enjoy the tea also. And you will see all of the herbs lined up across the back wall. Um, as well as the teas that I blend. I serve tea in-house. On occasions, we have local baked goods in there as well, so you you can enjoy it with your tea. But it's covered in flowers and plants. Some of them are artificial because they can't grow in all the spaces there, but I do have plants, you know, soaking up all the south-facing sun and um, rows of books. And we have... I don't even know how many white birch trees that are lit up in there just to make it look magical. And we decorate with the product. So it's not just in rows and rows like a retail store would have. We use furniture as product displays and we use the trees as product displays and things will be hanging from the walls and such too. It always feels like when I walk in there that I'm, I'm like stepping into like a lost scene in Alice in Wonderland. Where like yes. I I'm I'm trying to figure out like decor or product, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think it's like you know with your passion for thrifting and and, and things like that, like it, there's a there's an inherent hunt, and there it, it makes you immerse yourself in the environment in a way that you don't normally when you're having a consumeristic experience. Yes, and I tell people I'm like if you're asking if it's for sale or not, just ask, and I'll let you know if it's for sale. There's probably like four items in the whole store that are personally mine that are not for sale. I tend to try to keep them behind the register, but there are a couple of things that are out of the floor that I use for decor purposes. So in addition to that, you've also got uh, spaces for different practitioners to come in and uh, I, it's Halloween season. I'm just going to straight say work their magic. Uh, yes. You know, what, t- like, what types of services uh, did you envision for the space that when you're putting it together and what types of services do you offer? So 
I knew right away that we needed massage therapy. Um, you hold so much in sometimes that it physically ails you. So you hold your stress and your tension. Men, typically lower back, women, shoulders, and being able to have somebody help you take those away is wonderful. So we do have a massage therapist in the shop. We have an acupuncturist in the shop. We have two Reiki practitioners. We also have um, tarot readings and Akashic Records readings. And then I have friends that come in from out of town and do little special events for like palmistry or tea leaf readings. So we have a lot going on. How does one find those people? Well, I think if you look around, there's more of them than you realize. <laughs> um, my friend that comes in and does the palm readings and the tea readings, we used to work corporate together a long time ago. I had no idea she did that. Um, she had no idea. My intention was to open this shop and we used to do plant swaps together. So it just kind of fell into place, I guess. And you're, you're Reiki trained, correct? I am. So I actually infuse all of my herbs and teas and body care products with Reiki. And what does that, and what does that process entail? Energy, focus, a whole lot of love, a little bit of magic. I do for, so, and I'm I'm coming at this from a complete place of ignorance. Like, what you know, Reiki is a term that I I hear used a lot, and it seems like it, um, I don't know, like religion. It has a slightly different definition to every person you talk to. Uh, in in regards to you and your your sort of belief in in the process of Reiki and the uh, the value in it for your products, like how do you how do you feel that it. Uh, well, first of all, like, I guess, how did you come to, to being trained in Reiki? And then uh, secondly, like, what, what do you feel it offers on your products compared to, you know, other people who don't infuse their objects that way? Well, it's personal, I guess. Um, some people don't understand what Reiki is, but Reiki is the flow of energy. Um, a lot of people will relate Reiki to, what's the best way to explain it? Um, it's healing through touch or laying of hands where you don't actually have to touch, but your hands would hover around the object or the person so that you can do a flow of energy. So when you give Reiki, you also receive Reiki. So if you are trying to work with a person that maybe has migraines and you're holding your hands above their head, you're giving them all this energy that they need so that the energy flows through their body and they don't have everything built up in their head anymore, causing any pain. It helps them release it and when the energy flow top to bottom and back again. When I create t blends. I infuse the herbs with my energy because most of my blends have a specific purpose. I have a blend for migraines. I have a blend for if somebody's prone to UTIs or bladder infections. I have some that are just wonderful and they taste good and they're a dessert tea. But wouldn't you like a sense of calm and overall well-being while you're enjoying that tea? So it's just a little bit of extra love that goes into everything. It's interesting. Like I, as I was doing some interview for the, or doing some interview, doing some research for this show, I, you know, I was, I was just looking into like the history of apothecaries in general. And I, I, I didn't make it too far, but one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting is that if I understand correctly, Pennsylvania hospital, which is like the first hospital in the nation, uh, also had an apothecary as part of it. Um, and this is like late 1700s. Um, mm -hmm. 
And that was an important part of its role. And as that hospital evolved, uh, the apothecary expanded and, and became really, really important. And now we're at a point uh, kind of in, I don't know, corporatized medicine or just the inherent like understanding of how we think about uh, any sort of like ailments that there's kind of a weird separation of church and state between the traditional doctor route and the the more holistic uh you know way that we heal ourselves um and i just i found that really interesting thinking about you know the language that you've chosen because we when we were preparing for this interview we talked about like you know how do you identify like what's your role at the business you're like i am a proprietor and you know because proprietor like meshes really well with the term apothecary and i'm, I'm curious about um from from your perspective uh like why why is an apothecary such an important resource to have in a Liverpool, New York, or uh, you know, a greater northeast area, or you know, in your own small town? Like why why do we need these types of resources? Well, first, I don't think everybody needs a prescription for every small ailment that they have. Modern medicine. Western medicine completely has its place in the world. But I think a lot of times we forget that our bodies were built to last, kind of like a car. And if it means it's oil, oil change, do you throw the car away and get a new car? No, you add the oil, replace the oil, change the filter, all that good fun stuff. But our bodies were actually built to make vitamin D if we didn't have enough of it. Our bodies are built so that they can work to heal you if you have a common cold or anything like that. If you have a fever, it's because you're fighting an infection. So eventually when your fever breaks, you start to heal again, but your body knows how to regulate itself. Does it need a little help along the way? Sure. Of course it does. You can cut yourself, you can get sick, you can come in contact with a germ. You can have migraines. You can have high blood pressure. You can have problems sleeping. All of those factors of life come in to play. Do you take Tylenol for everything you need? Anything with, I mean, I don't know. I might be mumbling my words here, but there's a lot of people that want to try to allow their bodies to function the best that they can without having to deal with pharmaceuticals. And in all honesty, aspirin came from a plant. So if you have a headache, I'll add it to your tea and your headache will go away. But I think it's really important to remember what we have as far as resources. And they've been around forever. All of a sudden, though, one day, Everybody seemed to have forgotten about them. So it's nice to be able to provide a place for people to come to look for herbs because they want to make their own tincture or they want to make their own poultice or they want to make sure it's organic that they can put it in the herbs that they're putting in their pot roast. And I have people that come in for herbs to create their own teas too. But it's nice that people are aware of what we have around us. And generally, we get in conversations about who's growing what in their own gardens, too. So it's nice to know if they're growing stuff on their own. Well, and I think the other thing, too, well, I, I, two comments. One is that, um, you know, I, I'm not a specialist in this. I'm just sprouting my opinion. But, you know, we all have different ways of managing our own lives. And I think that oftentimes people fail to re remember that, like, the inherent stresses of life or, or just sheer existence does lead to pain, suffering and the like. It's just part of the process. And uh, that doesn't always result need to result in finding the remedy as opposed to either finding uh, the thing that'll help us get through it or using that as a moment to reevaluate what the what is causing these symptoms. And I think that to me is the part that really concerns me when I think about uh, how we think about Western medicine, because it's, you know, we often are so focused on symptom, symptom, symptom that we need that perspective. And I think your business does a really good job of like, I don't want to say, how do I say this? 
I'm going to say facilitating a conversation about what the ailment is. Um, you know, I've seen you work. I've seen the way that, you know, people come into your business and it's not, you know, somebody saying like, I've got a migraine, give me that. It's someone saying like, I'm feeling a little stressed about this. And then there's dialogue, which results in having this type of tea or this type of uh, service. That is the part that I think we've really lost. And I think that's one of the things that your business has done a great job of, of providing for the community. Yeah, I, it's funny because we're all human. I mean, I feel like sometimes we're more treat the symptom, treat the symptom, treat the symptom because, oh, you know, how do I get rid of that? There's no magic pill. There's no magic cure. There's no magic wand that can automatically, you know, transform me into Cinderella. I wish there was. <laughs> it would help me like put product away if I could just, you know, swoosh that wand. But once you communicate with somebody and you have an open dialogue with them and understand what's troubling them, what they're looking for, and then when you listen and truly listen and have a conversation and it's a two-way street, you're going back and forth and you're both giving information, you learn a lot. You you learn a lot about a person, you look what they're seeking, and maybe you can actually hear what the answer to their solution is if you just take that time to listen. Because maybe they're sleep deprived and they think they have insomnia, but that insomnia could be stemming from stress, financial worries, or maybe they just went through a divorce and there's other troubles. They don't know what to do about childcare or something. There's always something, but the root cause is what you need to get to to truly heal and overcome whatever obstacle or symptom you have at that time. And I think that in regards to to your business, the other thing that you've been listening to is the needs of your community. Uh, and I think it's fun that just as we've been prepping this and as I've been learning about your what you do, um, you know, it's it's a space like the the Blue Moon Apothecary and Wellness Center is a space that you can come in and you can you can purchase teas and you can, you know, have that dialogue. It's a place where you can have those services. Um but it's also an event space. It's a it's a place where you hold different events and you're out in the community doing things. Uh, you know, you're telling me that you've got a, a trunk or treat coming up in Liverpool on uh, the or play at my apologies, but uh, on the 27th of October. Like, tell me about the I guess the event portion of your business and why that was important to you. Community involvement is important to me. Um, I grew up in a little town. It was tiny. It was small. And everybody did everything together. Um, I remember we used to package boxes for refugees so that they would have, you know, warm sweaters. New York is cold. It's simply cold. And if you move here from another climate, you may not necessarily have the right clothes for it. So we would always do hats, mittens. Uh, wool socks, sweaters, and we would package them so they would be holiday gifts or welcoming packages when they came in and we were, you know, finding new shelter. But it's a village has to work together. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to provide the community that everybody needs. You should feel safe walking down your streets. You should feel welcome to come into a shop, even if it's just a chat. You shouldn't be afraid to go into places. And a lot of times when people don't know things, sometimes they become afraid. Um, it's funny. I have several customers from different walks of life. Some travel a lot and I hear feedback of experiences they've had in other places. For example, and I don't know the names of any of these places, go into a coffee shop and then we would use the restroom and they don't have a public restroom or even a restroom for their customers. And that just kind of floors me a little bit. You know, I don't know how somebody could turn somebody away from using the restroom. 
whether it's a child or an adult or anything. So I think being there for your community and them being there for you goes hand in hand. Um, whenever the village is working on anything outside or near the building, I just make sure I go out there and thank them and then tell them if there was anything they need, drink, restroom, come inside, we're here, you know, well, don't feel like you have to go somewhere else. Um, but it's community is huge. I'm a member of the chamber, which is absolutely wonderful. And that trunk or treat is sponsored by the chamber. I did it last year and it was so much fun. Absolutely so much fun. I get to dress up for Halloween, which I do multiple times for the Halloween season. It is my absolute favorite holiday. So I can switch up a whole bunch of different outfits in a week. And you meet people. You see children. I give them stickers and pencils and candy and make it an interactive booth for them to come up and they can see a crystal ball or a talking skeleton. And I have really quirky Halloween <laughs> decorations and interactive tricycles that, you know, go all by themselves. So it's a lot of fun. But outside of the chamber events, we also host some, like you said. So we have guided meditations and sound baths that we do in the shop. We have restorative yoga classes, jewelry making classes, and sip and shops, which are new. So we did them back in the spring, took the summer off because we had so many out of the shop events that I couldn't keep up. But we have already had the September sip and shop. October might be difficult. Um, because we have so many other offsite events, but the now those are my dad in November. So listeners out there, we just had our first laptop battery die in the middle of a recording. So uh, welcome to the IT portion of Meditations of the Ryan Slumming. Uh Kelly's back. So uh, the thing we, I wanted to ask you about was your, uh, your sound healing party. This is a new product that you're going to be uh, offering at, you know, for the community and, and at the shop. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So these will be a little bit different than the guided meditation with sound or the restorative yoga with sound. When you book a party, it is for you and five of your friends. You will have a two hour long party where you receive approximately an hour of complete immersion of sound healing. So there will be the crystal singing bowls, rain sticks, um, ocean drums, and you will be completely immersed in this wonderful healing modality. If you've never been to a sound bath, you're missing out. <laughs> the, you are mesmerized. You lose yourself and find yourself all at the same time. When you book the party for you and five of your friends, you also have options to have a flight of tea during the experience, well, after the experience. And you can also add to have Reiki for each of your guests during the sound bath. Or you can add on a tarot reading, a mini tarot reading for each guest as well. So you can customize your own party the way that you want to be, which is very exciting. I'm currently working with a local printing company that I know to have my own branded mini teacups made for the flights of tea, which is so very exciting because I like to keep things as local as possible. So that it's just the first trial run of them is absolutely beautiful. I'm very excited for it. And Sue and Michelle that will be doing the Reiki, the tarot, and the sound healing are absolutely wonderful to work with. And they do have space in the shop on a regular basis to see clients. Well, one of the things that I, I wanted to comment on was that, uh, you know, I think in, in the world of like business and entrepreneurship, everybody's really focused on how do I get the word out there? How do I get the word out there? How do I get the word out there? And it's what el algorithms need to, you know, need to work in my favor and who do I need to pay to advertise me and what influencer will uh, will talk, which I can confidently tell you that uh, talking with 
the Meditations with the Ryan Slummick podcast will get you tens of listeners. Um, but the word of mouth component is so vital for these types of uh, these types of initiatives. I mean, to the extent where like uh, you haven't even advertised that you're having these uh, these sound healing parties, and the month of October is is basically already sold out. Um, you know, I guess granted this is this is airing at the end of October, but like that's a, that's that's a big thing. Is that your you know your first first month, first month and a half, the spaces are already gone because people are instantly identify with that need. It is a huge need. Um, it's funny if you think back in time, what did people do when they wanted to get together with friends? How did they want to spend their time? And maybe there's still a huge demand for doing other things but the groups of friends that we see come through repeatedly for the same classes and by class it's not a one and done thing it's it's like going to yoga the more you go the better you feel um the healthier you are you get excited for the classes and for that hour of peace and relaxation same thing if you go to the gym for an hour but losing yourself for an hour and coming out of it being like, wow, I so needed that is something to be said. You know, you know, you can spend all the time in the world trying to lose yourself and you get that right practitioner in that right spot for that right moment. And that makes all the difference. Yeah, so I think one of the one of the main cornerstones of your business is understanding the body as maintenance, um, and and developing those uh, those routines to ensure that the body is is getting its its moment of reflection. Essentially, it is, and I mean, it all begins internally. You have to be willing, your personal self, to take the risk to. Maybe be vulnerable to your own self, not to anybody else, but just to yourself so that you can overcome whatever it is that you need to work out. And uh, just one uh, one other sort of main question for me, which is, um, how do I say this? Like, I think that oftentimes we talk about, we talk about healing as though it's a negative thing. It means there's, you have to acknowledge there's something wrong with you. Um, or on the flip side, there's almost a trigger word where, you know, somebody sits there and they say cancer and like, oh, I'm a cancer survivor, or they say migraines and they're like, oh, I get migraines all the time. Or, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's some sort of, you know, the inability to get it pregnant. I mean, there's all these different things where once you hear that you're, you, you latch onto that piece of hope. Um, but I think your business is really interesting in the sense that you have such a wealth of practitioners who come into this space. And so many of them that focus on clients with very specific needs. And I was wondering if you might be able to to tap into that a little bit and tell us like what type of needs um, the community is being served by your your professionals. So a wide variety. Honestly, we have one practitioner who focuses all of her energy for Reiki healing to those who are either suffering the treatments of cancer are a cancer survivor or have been diagnosed with another chronic disease. So that is her mission in life. That is what she puts her energy into because she wants to make sure that everybody has the ability to have those services tailored to their needs. That's our wellness Reiki offerings. We have standard traditional Reiki offerings as well for people who need the energy to flow through their bodies so that it can enhance their way of life or help them with the grief or grieving a lost one. Um, you can also have Reiki done for if you do have migraines. There is a practice to help alleviate that pain. We do have one practitioner who can receive messages while performing Reiki. Not all practitioners work that way, 
but she has the mediumship skills that she does receive messages sometimes from past ones. Um, our acupuncturist has a wonderful following clientele. She's been practicing for years and she can help you with, if you have a pinched nerve in your neck or if you have a migraine, let me tell you that migraine will be gone in less than an hour and it doesn't come back. Um, those are things that are, migraines are debilitating. Your emotions can be debilitating um, until you allow yourself the opportunity to get assistance for it. It can really be a roadblock in your life. Um, the massage therapist we have offers pregnancy massage, which apparently is not overly common. But you think about that. When you're pregnant, your body's going through a lot. And to give you a little reprieve and to relieve some of those, you know, you get compressed because you're carrying extra weight or the baby's lying on your site and you're sciatic. Oh my gosh. Child number two, he was a killer. <laughs> he was right there. And I know what that pain went through. Did I have a massage therapist that could help me with that? No. Do I wish I did? Oh, hell yeah. But um, we see people from all walks of life. And I'm thankful that they come into our space and look for guidance. Even if it's, you know, not what they were expecting at the time. I mean, if you pay attention and listen, which is a lot of it, I had a customer come in. And was just casually talking to me about something. So I gave her a sample of an oil to try and it completely removed and healed her flare up that she had because she's been battling with dermatitis and they can't figure out the cause for it. Sometimes it's hard to figure out the cause for things like that. If you've been gardening and you have a reaction to something or maybe an ingredient on a product that you used changed and you didn't realize it, but she received immediate relief and in a couple of hours, the flare-up was gone. So you just don't know what's going to happen that day or who you will encounter. Well, I, I one of the things that really stood out to me as I was, I was doing my research is that um, all of your reviews, It's this is not even one of those like... Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm buying, being hyperbolic and trying to make it sound like it's just, you know, like, like every one of your reviews, no, legitimately every review that was discussed, uh, was a comment about stepping into the space, feeling as though they were transported somewhere else and then having their concerns heard, which is what made your business stand out. And I think that's really interesting in the sense that when we talk about healing and we talk about um finding ourselves in a in a new place with new balance that step has to happen and i think if stepping into your business is the first thing that somebody can do to to reach that realization that there is an alternative um that's the highest piece of praise you can get for running an apothecary <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah so come in have a cup of tea with me that's it we well, can talk yeah. So for people who, you know, for people who are, are local to central New York, they can they can obviously come and, and, and swing by your shop. And for people that are, um, you know, from all around, they can go to your website and they can buy your stuff. But what is the what's the best ways to follow you? So I have Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and a full retail shop online on our website. So the website is thebloomandapothecary.com. And honestly, don't get mad at the IT person if it's not always 100% up to date. She's right here. <laughs> I do update it as quickly as I possibly can. But I'm also the person behind the scenes blending all the teas, you know, curing bars of soap and blending oils and making the rose water. So I try to dedicate a couple hours every couple weeks to update the website. I'm actually a little behind on putting new products on there, 
but that'll be taken care of this week. Um, but yeah, we are on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I have a link tree that sends everybody to everywhere. So I put that on my business cards and my banners for when I do out of the shop events, which there's a lot of lately, but I love going out there and meeting new people and telling them everything that we're all about. Yeah. So uh, it's the, yeah. So the blue moon apothecary.com. Uh, and if you're local, it's 612 Oswego Road, Liverpool, New York. Um, and I guess I would I would also just say that, uh, you know, one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on the show is this is a show all about the importance of opening ourselves to dialogue. And uh, window shopping online is fun. But, you know, as I've known from conversations with you, if tea, for example, is something that you're interested in and you want to know about the healing properties of, uh, you know, different types, the phone is open. You know, I mean, I, I've called Kelly multiple times and just asked questions and, uh, you know, the specialist is on the line. And I think that that, especially if you're out of town, is a very important part of the process of understanding uh, what products you're getting and what their significance is. It is. And I do have customers that will call specifically looking for a certain herb or a combination of herbs so they can make their own products. And I will let them know what we have, what we don't have. And I can actually, if I don't have it, I'll order it. You know, I have some wonderful suppliers and everything I order is organic and it is ethically sourced. So I'm actually BBB accredited and they verified everybody that I use to make sure I'm hitting the standards that I'm putting out there. Kind of crazy, right? I never in a million years would have thought that this little shop would be a member of the Better Business Bureau. Oh, cool. Well, yes. Kel Kelly, with that, is there anything that we haven't covered in this conversation that you'd like to kind of put out there? It can either, it can be related to whatever you're comfortable with. Um, the only thing I have to really close with is if you've not been in the shop stop in you just really never know who you might meet I'm not just talking about myself or the practitioners but it's a space for anybody to come at any moment and your first cup of tea is on me such a gracious uh offer and i can say that uh even if you're not a tea drinker just seeing the tea strainers alone is impressive and those are locally made also <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Kelly, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Uh, I I hope that you have a fantastic Halloween. And, uh, you know, with any luck, we'll get together and drink some tea soon. It'll be magical, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Ryan. So for the first time in Meditation History, we have a guest back for the third time in the same episode. So, Kelly, welcome back again. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so we recorded your initial interview about uh, a month ago. And as we talked about in the world of entrepreneurship, things are constantly shifting. But you have a really exciting announcement that we want to make everybody aware of. What's going on? Our business is actually moving. So we had the opportunity to take on a larger space, which will allow us to host larger scaled events and to provide more space for local artisans to have their products for sale as well. That's super exciting. And I know that we had talked about um, just the inherent evolution of your space and the fact that, um, you know, as a, as a business owner, when you want to do events or you want to, you know, host uh, host tea tastings or you want to bring in new clients, oftentimes you had to kind of shift your space around. And how is this new space, uh, which is, I think, 105 First Street in Liverpool, how is that going to uh, change the way you do operations? It is going to allow us to provide dedicated space for the events such as guided meditations, restorative yoga. I won't have to break down tables and chairs and move them into another room and prep the retail area for these events because they're going to have their own space now. We have plenty of rooms for practitioners, which are now all full for the new space. And we will have additional areas to host private events and 
plenty of space for people to come in and just have a cup of tea and visit with their friends either inside or on the balcony. That's super exciting. I think that, uh, you know, Liverpool is just this this ever evolving little community. And I think that, you know, moving to First Street and being a little more centralized is really going to is going to help you guys make an even bigger mark on the uh, the world around you. I'm pretty excited. So am I. It'll be wonderful. Awesome. So we talked about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes our goals don't necessarily line up with uh, reality. But at this point, you guys are hoping to be in your new location by November 6th. That's just a few days from uh, this initial drop date. And once again, it's 105 First Street in Liverpool. Is there anything else that you uh, you want people to know about this new space or about the sort of new way you'll do operations? We are going to operate the same way. We have a wonderful new booking system. So if you need to make an appointment with one of the practitioners, you're welcome to do so online or call in and we will gladly assist you with that. But it's going to be fun and exciting. It's a very beautiful, welcoming space already. And we're just hoping to enhance it even more. I think it's going to be amazing. And to our listeners, I really appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, If you like what you hear, please look up The World of Ryan Slomak on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please rate, review, like, and subscribe and share the show. But moving ahead next week, we've got a... uh, Another sort of spooky season thing going on. We're having not one, but two Ryans on the show. Ryan Slomick and Ryan Claytor will be uh, chatting. If you don't know who Ryan Claytor is, he is a professor at the University of Michigan. He's a comic artist. He's a book publisher. He also does tremendous art with pancakes and I argue is my doppelganger. So if you're interested in uh, some some weird happenings in the uh, the world of Ryan Slomick with uh, multiple Ryans on the show, please tune in on November 8th. Uh, And with that said, Kelly, could you tell us something? Make space for conversation. You just might learn something. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show, Kelly, and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.